So yeah, so um, today's session is going to be divided into two parts. Um, I will first be talking about essentially lessons that I've learned in my 10 years of blogging, you know, what works in data visualization, what doesn't. Um, if you want to become more professional in um, making data visualization, what are some of the lessons uh, that could actually help you along? Uh, and then in part two, I will actually be working on some uh, two case studies uh, uh, that I'll be pulling up jump and I will actually demonstrate how I do some of the work that gets into making the data visualization uh, work. Uh, so for those of you who may not know about my blog, um, it's been around since 2005. Um, you know, back in, in July 2005, that was my very first post. Um, that was a chart, I believe it was from the New York Times, but essentially uh, it, it, it illustrates the math and verbal scores of, uh, I think it was fifth graders or something, um, and it uses this sort of side-by-side -side, uh, column chart, uh, which is not very optimal for comparing things because you have to keep looking back and forth and jumping over these columns to compare things. Uh, it's much better to put them in a line chart. Um, and uh, also with very simplified axes. Uh, back in those days, if you were to look at this, uh, this blog post, you will, uh, and if you are aware of the work of Anne Tufte, uh, you would see that this is kind of a fanboy post. <laughs> um, and that's sort of where I started. You know, I, I was introduced to Ed Tufte in college by uh, Professor Howard Weiner, who also writes a lot about uh, data visualization. And, uh, and then that was my starting point. Now, if you've been following me for 10 years, you'll find that I don't always uh, uh, agree with Ed Tufte on everything. And um, there are other things that I'm doing now. Like, you know, those axes are, you know, interesting, but it is generally very difficult to create. I mean, in, in, in any, it makes your chart way too customized, and I, I don't agree with those axes anymore. Um, but uh, in any case, there are over a thousand posts in, in the 10 plus years that I've been doing this, so it is now a major resource for people in the field. You can get tons and tons of examples of published uh, graphics on there. Uh, with my commentary, as well as with commentary from uh, my community of uh, readers. So some of you may be one of these readers. Um, I really thrive on that interaction because readers send me stuff to write about. You know, as a blogger, <laughs> you know, the big problem is like, what do I blog about next? Um, so since I'm asking for uh, uh, submissions, I want to, again, uh, appeal for submissions that are of great charm. Uh, because 99% of the stuff that I get are, you know, shame that this is a really horrible chart. Uh, which is okay if it gives me bother to write about and it, it gives me inspiration. Um, but there must be some really great data visualization out there that you come across once in a while, right? Um, so do send me those, uh, despite the name of the, the blog. Um, it's not all about junk. <laughs> um, you know, and, and it's been uh, quite successful uh, over this, these years that I've been doing it, uh, mostly because people are reading it. Um, so I want to start most of my talk with this particular uh, quote. This was a uh, New York um, MoMA advertising from a few years back um, about a photography exhibit. So the quote says there's a vast difference between and making a photograph. Uh, so since uh, we have digital cameras and later we have smartphones, um, pretty much every one of us is just snapping pictures uh, all the time. And what this quote is really trying to say is that all these people who are taking photographs and uh, uploading the photos onto Facebook, Instagram, uh, Snapchat, uh, what have you, um, they don't really consider themselves as a professional. Um, they are taking pictures, but they're not making a photograph. So the, there's a different group of people who make photographs and they're the ones that are hoping that they will one day end up in MoMA, um, just like uh, this guy uh, handing it. Um, so the point here is not just about the tools that you're using, 
Um, I'm really talking to the mentality and kind of the, the approach to which you, you uh, take in terms of making uh, photographs. And um, it's the same thing in terms of uh, visualization. So ever since uh, Microsoft brought out Excel, uh, pretty much everybody can make charts, you know, um, and we see a ton of Excel charts out there. Um, you know what? People, uh, most of the people making these Excel charts don't consider themselves data visualization professionals. They don't have that mentality and energy. Um, they just do the Excel charts because you know they need to put something up onto PowerPoint, or you know the boss tells them to put something that uh, is uh, that's on text. Um, what you'll find is that people, you know, like myself, like a lot of my colleagues who really take uh, data visualization seriously um, are really obsessing over very little nitty gritty things on the chart. And you know, I, uh, I think one of the big secrets is sort of like, I spend probably three times as much time as the average person just really kind of looking at the chart, even if it is a very simple Y chart. Um, and, and that sort of obsessive, uh, Concentration on these details really does make um, make things different. Um, the what I want to then uh, give you is some examples of what I consider the power of visualization. So I'm going to show you a handful of charts where uh, one is not as powerful, and another one is more powerful, and um, and we can all emotionally feel that that is right, and then. Um, eventually, I want to come back and really talk about what exactly is the designer doing that evokes those types of emotions in us. So here is a chart that depicts a survey result from a uh, linguistic survey. This is coming from 2003. There was a Harvard linguist who had this idea very early in the evolution of the internet to do internet surveys. So he has a pretty large data set of thousands uh, of uh, respondents all, all over the US, and he asked about 150 questions on how uh, language is used, in, and he's hoping to discover regional variations in the use of language. So one of the questions was, what do you call a sweetened carbonated drink? And this was uh, illustrated by this map. This map is pretty clear. This message is not a horrible uh, map by any stretch of imagination. It's a dot plot. Each color represents one answer. So in um, out here in California, um, soda seems to be more popular, um, and same thing in the eastern uh, coast. But then in the Midwest, it seems like pop is the more popular word, and then down south, uh, Coke is often used as a word to indicate sweet Italian drink. So I mean, the message is still pretty clear on this map. Um, then, uh, 10 years later, after this research came out, a student from North Carolina State U uh, produced this map. Um, this map was essentially coming from the same data set. Uh, it illustrates the same question, um, but there's very little doubt if you have seen this map that this is much more preferred to, to this one. And, and this is not just artistically. Um, I'll get into this in a little more depth later as to why this map is actually uh, better in many different ways. Um, this map uh, was also proven uh, to be much more successful because when it first came out, uh, a few of the outfits like Business Insider and so on picked it up and it became viral. So it was like one that got like millions of uh, hits and things like that, so it spread around. And uh, even the professor who did the work was extremely grateful to, to, to Josh, who did this. Um, you know, you would think that he would be a little bit annoyed because uh, you know everyone thought this is so much better than the original one. Uh, but he was really happy about it because what happened was he got a lot of calls from uh, people. Uh, and they're not just interested in the fact that the math is better, they're actually interested in the underlying research. So that was how he started getting a lot of funding. So if you go to the website now, we now have this global project where he's investigating 
uh, linguistic differences uh, across the world. So it actually, you know, when, when done right, um, data visualization is very powerful. It gets people, you know, funding, research funding. <laughs> um, well, then the side story is George Katz, who's the guy who, uh, the PhD student who created these maps, um, also uh, got ahead because of, of, of this project. He's now um, at the New York Times graphic team, which, if you're a data visualization uh, person, is one of the most prestigious jobs that you can get out there. Um, and he has actually done work on, on uh, further work on both the underlying um, technology behind these types of maps. He has done maps like this for fan bases for different sports teams. Uh, he has also converted uh, the Dalit maps into other projects. Um, there's a very interesting project where he turns the question around and say, you know, if you were to give me answers to 20 questions, maybe 25 questions on how, what words you actually use, um, using this data that was collected, he can predict uh, which part of the country you might come from. And that's a very interesting project in itself. So um, here's a map from 2013, uh, not a map, but like a, a a hemisphere type diagram um, that illustrates in 2013 when our nation was considering authorizing sports in Syria uh, on the lead up to that vote um, where uh, Congress is standing, whether it's uh, in terms of uh, meaning yes or no and so on. Um, I saw this map and I wasn't too happy about it because you know it, it's very difficult for me to understand. Uh, what is the current process? I mean, the, the main question seems to leave a lot of work um, on my part to, to understand. So I created a different version of this. Um, so this one is literally answering a, a narrow question of, um, given what we know now, and given different assumptions on how the people are leaning one way or the other will vote, how they are undecided they are undecided will break, all the different scenarios, and it tells uh, readers directly under which scenario are we going to actually hit that 271 uh, minimum votes needed to pass the resolution. So on here, you can actually see that um, it's actually really, really hard. Uh, he basically needs every one of the undecideds to, to vote yes, to really get over. Well, given that, you only get 86% of the total votes needed to pass. So the chance is actually quite low. Um, but you know, in the previous chart, it's very difficult to figure out what's actually going on. Um, here, uh, I'm, I'm showing you uh, these things that somehow, even in this day and age, are still being published. So this is 2014. Um, this is a generic, uh, World Bank United Nations Technical Report. This one is World Development, Development Index Indicators. Um, these books always come with, you know, dozens if not hundreds of pages <laughs> of data tables. I've never really understood what people can do uh, with these tables uh, other than look out a very specific number. Um, so uh, later on, um, on comes Hans Rosling, who's a Swedish uh, statistics professor. Uh, he also moonlights as a YouTube <coughs> star. So this is sort of very interesting case where a statistics professor can actually be a YouTube star. Probably <laughs> once in a lifetime. So he has many videos on YouTube that have millions of views. Um, and you know, I, I encourage you to look them up. Um, he does a great job. Like what he has basically done is to create the software tool. Um, then you can see a screenshot. It's called GetMinder. And this tool basically took all of those uh, hundreds of pages of data and it dumped into this tool. And you can essentially create any kind of correlation between any sort of indicators you want. You can pick parts of the world. You can pick uh, certain periods of time. So it's a very flexible way of bringing all that data to life. So um, I think this is one of the most important and most interesting data visualization projects of recent time. It really took a lot of really stale data and, and made this work. Um, so going back to the theme of how data visualization can make you 
bridge. So get my that at uh, some years ago bought by Google. So I think Don roughly can afford a few uh, nice suits. <laughs> um, and you know, he's also on the speaking circuit, so he, you know, if you get a chance to uh, listen to him, I highly encourage it because he does give the he gives a great talk as well. Um, here is something that uh, was uh, showing up in the Economist uh, two years ago. So um, you know, it's about the ebook versus uh, printed book uh, competition. And the title of this, you know, the economist likes to have interesting, uh, ironic titles, but uh, it says taking off. Although it's very hard to understand what is taking off in this map, I see a shrinking set of um, uh, quadrants of circles. Um, you know, that's a, a view. Uh, this is very, very, very difficult to understand. And when I saw this, I actually visualized this data in this format. So in these six countries, there are two time frames for each country. Um, from, from this page, you can see that there's actually some interesting insights in this data. So Britain and the US are the two countries where the ebook market is uh, really taking over. And by 2018, um, it's projected to potentially overtake the printed book market. Uh, but ebooks are nowhere as dominant in places like Italy, China, Germany, uh, and to a lesser extent, Japan. Uh, but you wouldn't be able to tell any of this by looking at this chart. Um, so when you do your data visualization right, it does make a uh, difference in terms of the story. Uh, this is a Wall Street Journal um, graphic that showed up uh, again three years ago. Um, basically, this, this is illustrating a report in which the government wants to tell us are the broadband providers of this country uh, promising more than they're delivering in terms of speeds to you or the opposite, they are promising less than delivering more. Uh, so this chart has two sections. One is individual providers and the other section is aggregated up by technology, uh, the broadband technology, um, but generally, um, this is not a very good chart. Um, I, we visualize this chart in this way, where the technologies are grouped together, everything is ordered within each technology. Um, you can, on one service, you can see both the average within the technology as well as the spread around the technology, um, and everything is on one scale, so um, it's much easier to understand the information than in that two panel format. Um, here's a chart which would satisfy the hardcore and Chomsky uh, fans, where um, you have a data set that basically counts the NFL player injuries and by different parts of the body, and it's a very simple little trail of bar chart that basically tells you that most injuries occur on the knee and the ankle. Um, the reason why this was relevant is because of all the current headlines about head injuries in NFL, and I think the person who created uh, this data set is just basically saying, you know, head injuries are serious, but it's not as prevalent as some of the other things like knee and ankle injuries. Um, you know, I created this chart myself because I think that's what uh, the Dan Tuckley School would want. But you know what? Um, the uh, Wall Street Journal that actually published the original chart um, made something that looks like this. Um, this would be considered very, very bad by SMT. However, um, in my personal view, as well as you know, when I polled people in my uh, in my audience, it seems like a lot of people like this one um, in terms of you know delivering uh, the message. So, um, what I've shown you is comparisons of. of two different ways of showing the same data set. And I think in most of these examples, it's pretty obvious that one is actually better than the other. Now, that is sort of an emotional appeal uh, of, of this chart to us. Um, in most of the work that I do on my blog, what I'm trying to do is to connect that emotions to choices that designers make. 
So what this means is that we really need to have developed a uh, good set of language vocabulary for really describing that connection between desire choices and emotions that they generate. Um, because it's not enough, in my mind, to just label a child as this is misleading, this is not informative, this is confusing me. Um, but what I really want to get at is, okay, if it confuses you, what is it that the designer has done in order to make you confused? So let me um, go back to some of these charts. So you know, what do I not like about this chart? So I, I'm not a fan of this particular box plot, uh, box map, but you know, I want to tell you exactly why. So um, in a dot map, what we are relying on is the people to estimate the density of dots within a um, area, so here within this rectangle. But the issue here is that when you have different colors and if these dots are not particularly dense and they're all overlapping each other, it is actually quite hard to understand anything. All I can say in that path is that, okay, it seems like there's a mixture. Uh, but you cannot really say anything more than that. Like, uh, there's more green dots, there's red dots, blue dots, there's green dots, and it's really hard to, to really understand anything there. Um, in addition, you have the issue where there are tons and tons of uh, white space uh, in this chart. So the white space is not very helpful. I mean, the white space is basically the ideal color. Um, but it could actually mean something else. You know, they, it could have many meanings. It could mean that there are no people in those regions. Uh, it could mean that you, the people in those regions may not have internet or whatever it is, they don't respond to your calls. Um, there's a lot more white space than, uh, you know, that can be explained by lack of people. Um, it could also be how you process the data. Um, because in all of these maps, you basically got rid of um, the, the lower response frequency. Right. So if there are you know, some words that are only used by you know, a small number of people, it could have been taken off the data set. So that could have artificially generated my space as well. Um, you can come up with any number of reasons to explain that. Um, but the fact that it's white is not giving us a whole lot of information about that. Um, the other thing that is happening on this chart is that every dot is a single color. So, Despite the fact that there's a lot of data, in the fact you throw out all of your data other than the rank uh, number one uh, category in any given uh, location. So that, uh, that itself is a big problem for the color map. Uh, another issue is on the eastern uh, uh, coast, where in New England, for instance, the population density is extremely high. But if you have dot plots like this, there will be severe amounts of what we call overplotting. These dots are kind of one on top of the other. So what happens is that you can't really tell if there are other colors hiding behind the red dots. Um, so there's a lot of weaknesses in this particular uh, format. So what's wrong with this particular one? Well, there are a few things wrong with this. One is that this relies on relies on the reader to be able to estimate proportions based on some irregularly shaped uh, objects. So what we really want to know, for instance, what proportion is that half red uh, circle amounting to? And it's not really hard, I mean, it's really hard to know this unless you start counting. Um, the other issue is that there is some summary up there that says yes 49, no 199. Where did these two numbers come from? Well, in theory, they're connected to the stuff below. There are these two subcategories. But you know, it's, it takes a while to figure out that they're really only counting the yeses and the meaning yeses and the no's and the meaning no's. So that actually raises another problem, which is that 49, 199 ignores all the people that are undecided. But when you are trying to address the question of what is the likely prospect of the bill passing, the undecided is actually the more important group, and it's completely ignored here. Okay, this one has a gazillion problems, but generally uh, it's confusing because there are a lot of conflicting information that are being shown to the readers at the same time. So 
in the uh, larger map, um, the text that's faster than promised. In the aggregated uh, smaller column draw, it says the thing down the speed is a percentage of advertised speed. Now, it's very likely that promised is the same as advertised, but I'm not sure why, if you are used to different words, people might think that they're different. The other issue going on here is that the bar chart has a scale that goes from, uh, goes up to plus 39%, which is DSM, which is the satellite company. In the aggregated map, the satellite category has this number 139. Well, if you actually go back to the report, there's really only one satellite company here. So the 39% and 139 are exactly the same number. Uh, it's not that they decided to use uh, one scale, which is a difference, the other scale, which is a ratio or index. So that creates confusion, um, and it is all created by the design. Uh, thirdly, um, and interestingly, uh, there's some rounding issues that cause the columns to not match up. So, uh, the one percent is smaller than the negative one percent, and then you have two negative fourteen percent that are actually different things. Uh, and then finally, um, I have to say that this is a problem that I have solved after years of talking on this job. Um, somebody, if they could figure out why certain ones of these companies are voted, uh, please email me. <laughs> Where 
if the domain is, if they want to learn anything from it, it has to read your entire data set. That is the reason why the designer has placed all the data on there, because you realize that, you know what, if you don't have all the data on there, the child is useless. Um, this is exactly, this is exactly the same reason why I actually uh, don't like pie charts. Right? Pie charts are good for a lot of things, uh, simple data sets. Um, and people hate pie charts. But I think the biggest problem with a pie chart is that it is not sufficient. Um, you rarely see any pie chart that doesn't have labels of an entire data set printed on it. Why? Because again, if you were to hide all those data, you would not be able to tell which piece is large and which piece. Um, so one of the one of my big uh, uh, things that I like to talk about in my, uh, in my blog is that one thing you should always do is try to hide all the data labels and see if the chart still is usable. If not, then your graphical element is not doing enough work. So um, the other important um, thing that designers should be striving for is to make your chart easy. So it turns out that while the Wall Street Journal printed that tree map on the front page on the digital version of the Wall Street Journal on the same day, they, done, they have done something actually smarter. So on the right side, there's a boring um, bar chart, but you know what? They did all the calculations for you. If you, you focus on the green and the red bars, you can see that we have served 10 minutes more, we have worked 14 minutes less, we, we watched 10, 11 minutes more TV and apps and so on. You know, so why do you make people do all the work? Um, I think the one of the most important principles of data visualization should be to make it as easy as possible for your readers to get the message. Um, so that was the same reason why we did the whole serial whole thing. Because the problem with the top part is that the 49 came from those one on the edge together, well, which will take you a while to figure out. And then the 199 comes from the addition of those other four numbers. And then the other two numbers are completely ignored. So when I recreated my other chart, what I'm saying is, well, the whole chart serves one purpose, which is to give, let people estimate the chances that the bill will pass when it comes on the vote. So down here, I've laid out all the possible scenarios of how do you treat the other designers. So there's one scenario in which the designers is assumed to just break along uh, party lines. So all the one, one thirteen is going to say no, and the seventy two is going to say yes. On the other hand, you can also make an assumption that says the one thirteen is going to split according to the yeses and the noes of the current Republicans who have indicated their preference. That's a more complicated uh, assumption. So you can make all kinds of assumptions, but I think they all out. So you can kind of see exactly under what assumptions you get in that book. So that's making it easy. That's basically going, that's basically doing all the calculations on behalf of your reader as opposed to outsourcing it to your readers. Um, so uh, this is one of my favorite uh, data visualization projects uh, that, that I've been able to comment on. And um, the reason why this works, I think, has to do with the fact that uh, this new chart, this new map is actually thick. By thick, I mean that it is data rich. So I have mentioned um, the thought thought that this one problem, which is that every location is represented by only one color. So on the right side, uh, this whole cloudy sort of uh, smooth transition thing is very aesthetically appealing, but it's not just there for art. The cloudiness is caused by the fact that there's a lot of effort map. Um, one of the averaging is that um, Josh actually took the top three answers. Um, so he still dropped some of the data, but instead of dropping everything but the first one, he dropped everything but the first three, which leads to the red, the blue, and the green that can be mixed together uh, because each of these can be represented by a number. So the kind of orangey looking and the light greens and all that is coming from the fact that you're mixing colors. Um, in addition, the white space is mostly dark. So 
the way that he deals with the white space is how all statisticians would basically deal with white space, which is the idea that reporting that you know nothing is actually not very useful. But if you report a best guess of what the something is based on what you know, that's actually more useful. So what happens here is that if you take any location of the white space area, he has a spatial averaging algorithm that looks at the regional neighborhoods. So you get to think of concentric circles spread out going around that dot, and the further you live away from that particular location, the less weight you get. So he's basically averaging um, across the whole thing. So what in fact he's doing is he's giving his best educated guess of in those areas where you have no resources or the data is not there, what is the most likely uh, word that will be used to describe the species that they use the message. And so what I'm trying to link here is the fact that this map is beautiful, but it's beautiful also based on the design of choices um, in which he decided how to process or pre-process the data that causes this sort of cold cloudiness, uh, nice looking region. It's not just about art, it's both art and science. The next thing you want to do with your charts uh, is to make it sweet. So um, this is uh, this is a particular chart that that illustrates the data set that is how much uh, alcohol people are drinking. Um, and the if you know anything about this format, which is the so-called um, small multiple format, um, one of the cardinal rules of the small multiple format is that every single chart should be the same as everything else. The only thing changing is the country and the data of each, of each chart. Um, but something is screaming to you in this, in this chart. Up here, if you look at the top, it's telling you that South Korea drinks so much that it requires an extended act to accommodate the data. So um, Russia is the next one down. So South Korea is 7, Russia is 2.3, so it's like more than twice as much. Um, and that's a very smart thing that they've done, and I highly encourage you to pick this type. Uh, here is a different way of illustrating a similar data set. Uh, this showed up in Google Monitor, which is owned by Economist. Uh, anyone can find South Korea in the chart? <laughs> Is this like a little yellow thing? Um, does the designer know that? Is the designer just oblivious to the data? Doesn't know that South Korea is the point of this chart? <laughs> well, the designer actually knows because there's South Korea on its own 